Amen is right. I tell you, we are going to bring James in for a landing this morning. It has been a, uh, a great sermon series from my perspective. Not really sure from yours, but, uh, but I've enjoyed preaching it. Um, and I enjoy the concept of, of faith works. That's been the, the, uh, uh, that's been the overall title of this sermon series is Faith Works. And James plays that out all throughout, his, all throughout this uh, letter that he's writing. Uh, he's letting us know that, that faith is something that works. It means two, a couple of different things. When I, when I say faith works, obviously, faith shows up. Faith is not just something that we say that we have. Faith is not just a, a proclamation uh, of, a, of a set of beliefs that we, um, you know, that we intellectually assent to. Faith is the outworking of, of the beliefs that we say we have. Faith is, it shows up and can be seen by people on the outside. You know, too much of, uh, of, of our relationship with, with God is thought of as this, and I'm going to use the air bunnies, personal relationship. We like to talk about that. We have a, a personal relationship with God. Well, that may or may not be the case, but one thing I do know is the case is that we have a, a, a communal relationship with God. I know for a fact, I, I'm still searching for the personal relationship but I know for a fact that we have a communal relationship because those who are saved are being added to the church, to the body. It's all about being part of this, part of something bigger than ourselves. And, and so our faith is something that is seen on the outside by other people. And that's when, uh, you know, the, the first Peter uh, verse that was read earlier. I love that. He's, you know, because later on in that same passage, he says, and when people come to you and ask you, why are you the way that you are? You'll give them a, a reason. You'll tell them, let me tell you about the hope that I have in Jesus. Let me tell you about the, the, the relationship that I have with Jesus. And the only reason they're going to come and say anything to us about that is because they see our faith on the outside. It's working. Our faith works it's also our faith works because it does something to us when we the the whole point that James is making not the whole point but a entire point he's making is when we trust God something amazing happens when we trust God we experience God's trustworthiness let me say that one more time because it, it took me a while to understand that this week. When we trust God, and, and that's in all kinds of things, whether it's with, with our, our relationships, whether that, and we're going to see what, what trusting God really looks like at the end of this passage. And let me tell you something, get ready because we don't like it. But when we trust God in our relationships, we see God's trustworthiness. When we trust God with our finances, we see God's trustworthiness. When we trust God with, with all of the, uh, the, the righteous choices that we are called to make, we experience His trustworthiness. And that just compounds on we trust more and more and more. And the more we trust God, the more we find to entrust to God. I thought I'd get a little bit of an amen on that because that was smart. That was smart, guys. Come on. The more we trust him, the more we learn what we can, entrust, we can give up to him. All of the worries, all of the concerns, all of the anxieties, all of the complexities of life, the more that we just depend on and we trust God with it, the more we can entrust to him. And so when I say faith works, that's what I'm talking about. And this morning, we're going to bring it in for a landing with, I believe, uh, one of Jesus' favorite topics, and that is prayer. And as you see, he ends this, he says, look, is anyone among you troubled? Are you, are you in trouble? Well, the, the, the ESV, the English Standard Version, uh, translates that word for troubled as suffering. 
Is anyone suffering? He says, let them pray. Now, I love that. I love the language that they're, the, the way the English translates it. And it says, is anyone suffering? Let them pray. So he's talking to the rest of us as though we're not suffering. And he says, so is, is that person over there suffering? Let them pray. It's almost as like saying, hey, don't interfere with their praying, but it's also encouraging them to pray. And so one of the things that we as a community have to understand is when people are going through hard times, prayer ought to be our first line of defense. Prayer is not this thing that we, that we wait until everything else is exhausted, and then we just pray. One of the, you know, you, you understand the, the relationship that our culture has with, uh, with God through certain phrases that come along in everyday life uh and so if i say uh if i say oh man he threw up a hail mary he threw up a prayer i what am i talking about last resort and typically in what sport in football what is that what kind of a play is that what desperation desperation i mean the hail mary the throw up a prayer is like all right everybody go deep and i'm just gonna throw it up and hope something good happens that's our societal relationship with prayer in a nutshell right there when all else fails randy then what that's what we then then we got i guess we're gonna pray but he's saying, let them pray. Don't step in. Let that happen. And he's telling us who are suffering, the, very, uh, you know, the way he wants us to understand the end of this whole faith works concept is when, when you're suffering, go to God. Trust God in that. Interact with God. Don't try to plan better. Don't, don't try to analyze better. Don't try to make better choices all of those things, which th those things might come, those things might be appropriate, but the first thing we have to do is interact with God. When things are at their worst, we should be interacting with God. We should be letting one another, we should be joining one another in this godly interaction. He says, if anybody's suffering, let them pray. Now, I love what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, let them pray and everything will be fine. Because the suffering might not go away. But isn't it better? Isn't it better when, when, we, when we talk to God about things, when we commune with God about things, when we are, are reminded by God of the goodness that's ultimately in store for us? Because again, I will remind you, Prayer is not getting from God. Prayer is getting with God. Prayer is, is, is aligning ourselves. We're not asking God for, hey, you know, God, I know you've got your will, but I want you to change your mind and do what I want you to do. Prayer is us aligning ourselves with the already sovereign will of God. And so one thing, you know what we do in suffering when we pray? We learn from it. We learn from suffering. Sometimes we learn things not to do. You know, it's like I, when I, I, my favorite joke, a guy goes to the doctor, not my favorite, but one of them, guy goes to the doctor, said, hey, doc, I broke, my, I broke my leg in three places. And you know what he told him? Stop going to those places. I mean, that, that's, sometimes when we pray, we find out, you need to stop going to those places. You need to stop making those decisions. You need to stop sticking your finger in that light socket. Because those things will hurt you. And the more that we pray, the more that we get with God, the more our suffering makes sense. Because either I've done something uh, I shouldn't have done, or I'm with people I shouldn't be with, or I'm interacting in a certain way that I shouldn't be doing. Maybe I'm going to learn something that's going to, uh, uh, to uh, you know, illuminate the reason for my suffering. Or maybe I'm just going to get strength to continue in my suffering. Because other people might need to take courage from my suffering.
they might need to see, hey, if he can go through that and keep, a, a, and keep an attitude of grace, if he can go through that and keep an attitude of forgiveness, then, then this little bit of suffering I'm doing, oh, I can do that. Isn't that what he means when he says, look, when you, you know, in the Hebrew letter, he says, uh, the, the writer of Hebrews says, if you, in your struggle against sin, just relax because you haven't struggled to the point of shedding your own blood. He's saying, look, you know, Jesus suffered way more for sin than we ever will in our sin. So just, you know, before we start having this big giant pity party, just relax. I think that's what he's saying. The, 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 it gets lost in the Greek translation, but I think he's saying, you know, in your struggle against sin, just, just relax, people. It, it's not as bad as you think. But that's the idea he's given. When, when we're suffering, pray, get with God. Then he goes on to say, are you cheerful? If it, is anyone happy? Uh, you know, is anyone cheerful, anyone happy? Let him sing praises. Let him sing songs. Let us, you know, are you cheerful? Are things good? Do you, are you happy about life? Then worship. Go to and interact with, you guessed it, God. Because you know what the, the you know what's harder to do in good times than in bad times? Pray. Now, in bad times, we're, we're at least reminded, I mean, because, you know, obviously we're going to get to that, we're going to get to that desperation point. Anybody got into a desperation point of good times? Because I need to know what, that, what that's like. You know, you're, things are just so good, I'm desperate to call on God. No, we don't do that. But when things are bad, we get desperate, so we call on God. But when things are good, when things are going great, do we just wake up and, man, God, it, it is a great life. I've got a great job. I've got a wonderful spouse. I've got, you know, these pretty okay, decently all right kids. I mean, whatever it is, are we just praising God in the good times? Because he says when things are good, get with God, interact with God, worship God. Because the cheerfulness might not, just like the, just like the suffering might not go away, the cheerfulness might not stick around. He's not saying, are, are things good? Praise God and they'll always be good. He's saying, when things are good, worship, praise God. Because they might not last. And you know what we are? If we're nothing, we are habitual creatures. And interaction with, you know what, one thing he's saying about faith? Interaction with God has got to be a habit. It's got to be a habit. It's got to be the first thing that we think about. Oh, times are bad. God. When times are good. God. That pretty much got them all covered. Can, kind of, can times be so-so? Well, it's just a, you know, a degree of goodness or a degree of bad. But everything is an interaction with God. Then he goes on to say, he says, anyone cheerful, let him praise. Is anyone among you sick? Now, this is where he, he brings in somebody else. He says, are, are you sick? Well, then community. Go to, interact with God through his people. But your sickness might not go away. Because that's what we've experienced. He says, he says if anyone, or, or is anyone sick, let him call on the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. Now we know that this isn't just about getting better. Because we've all prayed for people in faith. We've all had the elders come and pray over people with faith, and they've still gotten sicker and died. He's not talking about pray and you'll be fine. He's saying pray, but, but what he is saying is pray and you will be fine. Spiritually. Because what he's, all of this is getting our attention away from what we're physically going through and getting us in touch with what God is able to do in our life. What God is able to do through us. And that's how we endure. That's how we go on. Because we have this living hope. We have this imagery right here that we live every day under, knowing that, that having faith that moves us, that transforms us, that, that actually works, it, it, because of this, because of the reality that we know for a, for a fact, it, it does transform us. It does move us beyond the physical. And that's so important for us to, to, to grasp and to latch on to. And that's why he brings up Elijah right here. Because it's kind of a, 
of a weird spot to bring up this, you know, the kind of the first interaction that, that Elijah had with, with the miraculous, and that is just praying for, for rain, for praying for drought, and then praying for rain. And he, so he goes, he says, look, Elijah is a human just like you and just like me. I love the fact that he, he takes the time to, to bring up the humanity of this person and then says, just like me and you. He's a human just like me and you. So this can work for me and for you just like it did for him. He said, Elijah prayed and there was no rain for three years. Then he prayed again and it rained. Now that wasn't Elijah's idea. If you go back to, to the Old Testament where, where that story's found, it wasn't Elijah. Elijah didn't just say, you know what, I'm, uh, I got this idea that I'm just going to wreak havoc on, on these people. It was God's will, it was God's leading that made him do that, that he got in concert with God and prayed this prayer, and that's what happened. And he's saying, if prayer can change the physical world, it certainly can affect the spiritual world. Let me, let me elaborate. Remember when Jesus said, is it easier to forgive sin or tell someone who's lame to pick up their mat and walk? Now, you think about that. Now, the answer that, that we know is, well, it's, it's, it's harder to forgive sin because we, you know, we can't do that. Well, the whole point he's making is that only God can do either one of those. Only God is, is powerful enough to do either one of those. And so if God can change the physical world that we all can see and interact with, why do we think that he can't the spiritual world? And that's when he brings forgiveness into this. Because one of the things that he knows is that there are barriers between us and God that hinder our interaction. There's a big giant barrier that hinders our interaction with God because we're typically wanting to avoid him. I mean, think about if you've done something to somebody and they know it, they know what you did and they know it was you, how comfortable are you in their presence looking them in the eye? Not, not very. You're not, not very comfortable showing up and interacting with them. And so one of the things that James is bringing to our attention is that there is this big fat barrier between us and the life the faith work life that we need to have and it's our sin it's our sin and that's why he says look it, it, you know pray and you'll be forgiven you will be forgiven there is forgiveness in this relationship with God and he says look you know pray with one another confess your sins to each other now if we were having a, a prayer night and we said, okay, we went around the room and we got everybody's schedules and we, made a, we had a, a, a prayer night where everybody, we, the, the planets aligned and everybody was free and nobody had any, any uh, um, prior engagements or commitments or whatever. And we knew that everyone was available on this night and we had a prayer night. We would have a lot of people show up to pray. Leslie, you agree in our we, we would have Not everybody, I mean, you know, because... Not everybody, but we would have a lot of people show up to pray. Now, if we had that same situation where nobody had any conflicting arrangements at all, whatever, and we were going to have a confession night, even fewer. I mean, we're going to get together and we're going to confess to one another. I mean, we're going to just hear it all. We're going to just get down and dirty in the weeds and just... Tell everybody, each other, ourselves, all our, all our sin. No. Nah. I mean, we could have the most amazing potluck catered for that night, and there would still be no one here. We could have potluck, hand out $100 bills, and offer limo service to and from. Nobody's showing up. Well, you might show up, but you know you're going to lie. <laughs> and say, yeah, I know, I... I didn't brush my teeth that day. I mean, what? Well, that's the worst thing? No. No, you're going to. But he says there should be no barriers. Prayer made, prayer made physical change a reality. Do we believe? 
here's the question, and this is, this is the, the working of your faith hinges on this. Do we believe that prayer, that interaction with God makes spiritual change that same reality? Do we believe that? Do we believe that, that approaching God, that communion with God, com- and interacting with God, do we believe that it can have the same changing effect on our spiritual condition as much as we believe that it does our physical condition? The problem is, is that so often, whether it's for physical or spiritual, prayer is a desperate act of a last-ditch effort. And what he's calling on, he's saying, look, if we're going to be people of faith, if we're going to have working faith, faith that shows up, faith that, that when, we, uh, when we see someone in need, we just offer them help. We have faith that when, when a rich person and a poor person come into our assembly, we treat them all the same. If we're going to have faith that, that's going to be uh, joyous in, in all circumstances when we find ourselves in, in suffering or, or in, in happy times, if we have that kind of faith, It's going to show up. It's going to show up. Do we believe that the ultimate faith work is mutual concern for our community of faith? Do we believe that that God can change the physical and that he has changed the spiritual? Do we believe that? Because when we really believe that in our faith and, and we have this outworking of, of actions uh, uh, that is called faith, the physical world is drastically changed because the spiritual world is active and moving through us. So as we think about all of the faith works that James brought up, whether it's considering it pure joy when we face trials of many kind, when it's treating everyone with the same amount of respect and it's not showing favoritism, if it's uh, you know, being careful of what we say, guarding our, our, our mouths and our language and the way that we interact with each other, whatever it is, do we believe that, that this faith has an impact on our eternity? Do we believe that? Because when we, when we do, the world is a much different place. So as we bring this in for a landing, I just want to encourage us all that, are you suffering? Pray. You full of joy? Worship. Are you sick? Call on your brothers and sisters in Christ. Because there's power in this, in this faith. There's power in this faith fellowship, in this community. And it's not only power to change the physical, but it's power to change the eternal. We have another song coming up. What's our next song What we're singing? I Am Resolved. Oh, there it is. I Am Resolved. Are we resolved? We're going to sing this song in in the wake of this sermon where we're talking about this faith that shows up. And as we sing this, we are going, I want us to think about what are the ways that our faith is going to show up in, a, in this coming week? What are the specific things that we've studied, that we've talked about, how faith is going to show up this week? Will you stand with me as together we sing?